founder and uh, chairman of the Dallas Entrepreneur Center, um, which I ran for uh, recently. We now have an amazing new CEO named Alex Alton. Um, he created this concept of this speaker series with entrepreneurs organization, or EO. How many of you are familiar with EO? Anybody here? So EO is a really interesting organization. A lot of the work that we have done at the Dallas Entrepreneur Center or the DAC over the last several years has really been early stage. How do we help take an aspiring entrepreneur with an idea and help develop that idea, help provide necessary education, necessary mentorship, necessary community, events like this to really drive it forward? Entrepreneurs Organization is an organization that I've, that I've loved for many years because it really focuses on that next stage. What happens after you begin to grow? What happens when you get between you know, one, two, two million, 20 million revenue? So you've got a proof of concept, you've got something that's working, but you really need to scale it. And so the deck has been partnered with EO for a while, um, but we've never done anything like this. And the, and the reason I'm specifically excited about what we're doing at EO right now is the concept that um, EO has their own accelerator program. And the accelerator program so cool about it is really focused on the most important aspect of building a company, which is sales and growth. And so the accelerator program, you're going to hear more about later from Wolf, who runs the accelerator program, is about how do we help take you from 250, you know, wherever you are in terms of revenue, to over a million dollars. Like, let's make this thing really begin to grow. And so um, the Deck Network is really excited about doing a series of programming. Um, an event, a speaker series with EO that will be at a bunch of different co-working spaces all across downtown, all across the city. Um, and the idea for that is that we really want to come to um, the individual communities and find entrepreneurs where you're at and provide you relevant and compelling content. So what a better way, I mean obviously as an entrepreneur, one of the things that I always laugh because you get any entrepreneur in the world to come out to a, to a conversation about raising capital. Because trust me, I've been an entrepreneur many times. We all think we can raise capital, right? And what better way to talk about that than bringing out local entrepreneurs who are, either, who are either bootstrapping their business or who have raised capital themselves. And I decided tonight, we've got a ridiculous panel of people that have been doing this in Dallas, people that are successful, that have done it companies that have done it in different rounds, and that's what the real value is in something like this, is having somebody who's been there and done that willing to be transparent, authentic, and share that information with you. So tonight, we're going to have several people get to come up on, on stage in this panel and go through a bunch of questions. We're going to ask them some questions that we have created for them ourselves, and then we're going to leave some time at the end for you, men and women, to be able to ask questions yourself. Um, so that's really what this series is about. We're going to be here. We're going to be in Serendipity Lab. We're going to be at um, WeWork and Common Desk and the Capital Factory Tech location. But I really do want to thank Industrious for hosting us tonight. Can you guys give them a round of applause? <laughs> They've been a great um, partner in the, in the, um, and collaborator inside the entrepreneurial ecosystem. They do amazing things to help support um, entrepreneurs here in Dallas, and so and it's Jessica around here. I don't know, there's Jessica. If you guys are interested in learning more about industries and what they do in the space, see, having tours, learning about space opportunities, we definitely want you to have that opportunity to talk to Jessica about that because this is one of the great organizations in town that helps entrepreneurs be successful. Um, so right now, though, without further ado, I want to invite our panelists and our moderator. Uh, to the stage. Wolf's going to be our, our moderator. He's the head of EO Accelerator in Dallas. And then I'll let him introduce our panelists. So this is a weird thing that I like to do, and it's kind of weird, and I'm sorry to bother you, but when, I, when we invite somebody to the stage, um, it's kind of nerve-wracking to get in front of a bunch of people, and everybody's looking at you, and you feel kind of awkward. I like to give them like a standing up round, rousing round of applause. Can you guys stand up and give them a <laughs> Accelerator program. Uh, just to give you a very quick background, 
EO, which started over 20 years ago, stands for Entrepreneur Organization. It used to be YEO, which is kind of a predecessor to the YPO, if you're familiar with that. And uh, we have over 13,000 members globally in over 100 different countries. So a big organization. About 10 years ago, we realized there was a big piece of the market that was being underserved. And EO traditionally had a, a minimum of 100, or excuse me, a million dollars in gross sales per year. And you had a lot of great startups that were under that that maybe didn't fit the EO model, but still wanted some sort of a group to come to, collaborate with ideas, et cetera. And so that's how Accelerator was born almost 10 years ago to today. Uh, we've got over 2,000 active members right now in the US. Uh, and then globally, we're adding chapters about two each month. And so Accelerator is designed for businesses, companies that have between $250,000 and a million dollars in revenue per year. And the idea of Accelerator is to accelerate you to that million dollar mark. And a pretty telling stat that I like to share is that only 4% of companies, this is statistically, nationwide, actually make it to a million dollars in sales over the whole growth of their, their life. So only 4% Accelerator members have a four times likelihood chance of getting to a million. So 16% of Accelerator members. It's still a relatively small number if you think about it, but when I can four times my odds of accomplishing something, I think we're doing something right. So very excited to be here and moderate this panel. Uh, when Trey and I sat down late last year to, to think about topics, obviously the first one that came up is raising capital. It, it tends to affect companies at all stages, whether it's an idea stage or you're about to exit and you need a convertible round to get you to that next level. So I think it made sense to start with uh, raising capital We've got four great panelists here, and, and before we jump into the questions, I'll ask each one to talk to us a little bit about themselves, their background, uh, and then we'll start. I will say, if you guys have questions, I promise we'll have time for them at the end. So write them down, remember them, put them in your phone, etc. cetera, but, but we're not gonna take questions during the, the panel, but we'll take them at the end, I promise. So uh, Bruce, do you wanna lead us off? Great, hi, uh, my name is Bruce McFadden. Um, I Quick background, um, I'm currently with a company called Door, you guys know the residential real estate company, it's in the boards around town, I'm the chief operating officer there. Um, my background, 12 years actually hedge fund guy, and then the last 10 years all early stage businesses. Um, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention, I'll mention here briefly, is a lot of, uh, of my focus with early stage businesses is around just understanding who you are, and understanding, making sure you get the right people in the right seats. It's such a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. Um, and, and so I, perhaps different than these guys, my focus generally is, is partnering with entrepreneurs in a business that's early on and helping grow it quickly. So the prior company was a company called Armor, cybersecurity company up in, in Richardson. Uh, I joined there as COO um, early on at about 20 people, and then we took it from 20, we raised about 60 million capital across four rounds, um, and um, it had about 270 or so people there now. And then joined Door about two years ago. There's about 10 people there, and we've since raised just raised close another round just recently. Uh, we raised about 20 million, and um, we have bought about 10 to about 100 people in the last last uh, two years. Great. Also, hi, I'm Craig J. Lewis. I'm the founder and CEO of a technology startup called Gig Wage. We help businesses pay, manage, and support independent contractors and freelancers and gig workers, etc. And we're hyper solely focused on 1099 people. Uh, my background, uh, I won't go all the way back, but I'll just say it, I started at AP, I'm sure it's a little small payroll company, maybe a couple of you have heard of, uh, in 2008, right around the time of the marketing crash, so I was one of the top sales professionals uh, for their small business software unit, and I fell in love with payments and HR and all the kind of corny stuff that a cool guy like me should not be involved in. Uh, and so I stayed involved and uh, finally found my way to kind of start up land and uh, join the company that was at an, in an accelerator in Silicon Valley for African American owned technology uh, startups. My partner Brian McKean had just left Apple and wanted to start a mobile timekeeping company. And uh, I had built this kind of career in payroll and I was like, oh, I can help you sell that. And I was like, oh, this little cute startup thing you're trying to do. And, I fell in love with it, and that's when I went from PCs to Macs and suits to jeans and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, and so Kairos was phenomenal. We started off as a timekeeping company, raised some money, um, 
on Sand Hill Road up and down the both coasts. At our peak, we were about $120 million valuation, hit some rough spots, bounced back, pivoted, became a facial recognition company before your iPhones. Uh, so we, were, we have several patents around facial recognition, et cetera. And then in 2015, I left my day-to-day -day activities there, kept my stake in the company, and started this company where we had a totally different thesis about four and a half years ago. Did the same thing I did at Kairos, bumped my head, pivoted, rebranded, uh, and we've raised uh, a, few, a few million dollars now to kind of get this idea rocking and rolling, and we're really starting to see some fun traction, so we're having fun. Very awesome. yeah. um, John Hinkley, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Modern Message. Uh, we started around 2012 uh, and kind of bootstrapped it for two years uh, so we got our first seed round in 2014. Uh, but I'm uh, Dallas, born and raised, uh, entrepreneurial at heart, unfortunately, but fortunately, uh, I, I, there's nothing else for me out there. Uh, and I've been kind of uh, doing the entrepreneur thing since I got out of college, which is really all I know how to do. Um, and my first failure is um, was I, I invented the, uh, the lime slicer and got a patent on it, which uh, I tried to sell like crazy and uh, you know, it didn't really go very far, but it taught me the idea of like, hey, if you have an idea, go hard at it, create it, and it's okay if you fail at it because if you learn a lot and you can go to the next thing. So, and I say failure because of, you know the, the process as you guys know is I'm sure there's a lot of failure involved in that. Okay, so learning along that way. Um, so I've been through three funding rounds. Uh, our modern message has a program called Community Rewards, which is the nation's largest uh, lowest rewards program for apartment communities. <coughs> and so that's what we do. And, um, going strong, so happy to be here. Great. Well, by the way, hi, my name is David Dini. I'm co founder for that young lady over there, Mechanica. And we founded the Kinetic Experience. And what our whole premise is, is working with the whole life of an entrepreneur to help them create a life of abundance for themselves and really define what that means for them. Just a quick question, how many of you guys are, are first time entrepreneurs here in the room? Okay, awesome. So my, my journey to entrepreneurship started here in Arlington, Texas where I grew up and it was just because we didn't have any money growing up and I did it a side hustle so my brother and I could just weasel our way into our neighbor's pockets and we made some, some good money like that. Uh, I ended up having a degree from electrical engineering from UT Arlington and I did flight test engineering for four years. And then I had a big opportunity, uh, a risky opportunity to jump out in 2005. And I left the day, I left the helicopter to work with my brother in a startup called Social Smoke. Uh, and that's, that company started in October 2003. So when I left Bell, uh, my salary went down 8%, and I took a big, big, massive jump to make that happen. But we self-funded that business, and that business is still thriving today. In 2015, I loved the day-to-day -day of that to really kind of figure myself out and what I wanted to do. Uh, and what I really, really realized ultimately was that I love working with entrepreneurs and scale face of their business and really around solidifying an idea for them to move forward with. But what I what I realized is that so often entrepreneurs get stuck uh, because their their mindset isn't there and they're having a hard time communicating really what their own core values are and what is the mission of their life. For, for themselves, and then that makes it really hard to attract the right team and, and to attract fun, ultimately, and so forth. Uh, so that's kind of my background. I'm super excited to be here with you today. And you can see a, a pretty diverse background, but all have, at one point or another, dealt with some sort of a, a fundraising, either challenge or opportunity. Uh, and so I'll, I'll ask each of you some individual questions, and if, if anyone else wants to jump in and take you back, by all means. Uh, Craig. You raised, as you mentioned, money for a few different companies. How did you know when it was time to go for money? Did you generate revenue? Did you have a user base? Or did you just have an idea that you needed capital for? I've done it all. Okay. Nothing's right. Uh, so <laughs> the first piece of money I ever, I ever raised, I, I, I'll say raised, the first outside capital I ever brought into a company. So I told you guys about the two that are successful but there was a few before that that I kind of skipped over. <laughs> uh, so the first time I ever raised money was my very first company. I was playing professional basketball in Europe. Um, I had uh, gotten married. My wife was not ecstatic about me hopping the country, different countries playing basketball and stuff. And so we, we laid the ball down and decided to start a company. And I started a sports marketing company and took a small business loan 
from First Conway Bank in Arkansas. $25,000 loan, I'll never forget it. I was like, wow, this is cool. Uh, <laughs> after a, a long suit and battle with First, Way, First Conway Bank, uh, I decided not to do, go the lending route anymore. And so every company I've started since then, we've known from day one that we wanted to raise money. Um, uh, this company, Gigwage, again, previously started with a different brand and model. We raised about a half a million dollars on a PowerPoint and uh, an idea. It was a keynote. Um, and so I've done it all where we've had traction, we've had revenue, but we, you know, we go into these businesses with the intent of raising venture capital, trying to build, taking a lot of risk, trying to grow up a, a big business really fast. Uh, and then seeing where we land. And so it hadn't really been a big decision-making process for us in either, either of the last two businesses. We knew we were raising money. We needed to buy some time, buy some runway. And so that was a strategy we took out of the gate. But what I've what I learned from doing that is I would suggest get as much traction as possible before you do that. Because even if you're successful raising money without customers and without revenue, which we did, uh, the backlash is pretty tough if you don't hit your milestones and hit your marks. Then you have to deal with investors uh, who had uh, expectations that weren't met. And now not only are you running your business, but now you're trying to manage this investor set of people that are, 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 are upset, right? And typically an angel round is gonna have a, a group of people involved. And so now you're managing not only one or two investors, but you've got five or 10 or maybe 15 people that have written you a $50,000, $100,000 check and they're pissed because you're talking about you're gonna do something totally different all of a sudden, right? So I advise people to get as much traction, as many customers, as much revenue as possible before you raise, unlike me. I'm, I'm insane, like I'm stupid. I don't know why I do it, but it's fun. And I'm not stupid. I, all cameras erase that. I, I'm smart. Investors in the market. Don't invest in the investors in the room. I'm actually really smart. Bruce, you talked about a few of the different leadership roles you've had. What are the key stages or maybe accomplishments that you think a startup needs before they're able to do funding? Well, I totally agree with you. I, I think um, I, I'm on the board of a company here uh, called Blossom Street Ventures. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It's a Dallas Angel Network and they create a fund. And, um, and they only invest in, in post revenue businesses. And I say that because as you, as investors are talking to uh, earlier stage businesses, there are, if, if you have the opportunity to talk to ones that don't have any revenue, there's millions of them, right? And so every investor has heard, anybody who has potential to invest has, has heard from thousands of companies that don't have revenue that long. And so to completely agree with what you said, um, traction with some revenue, with actual people paying you cash into the business, dramatically um, uh, opens the door to people. Obviously, it still creates there's other challenges to get people across the uh, finish line. But if you can bootstrap it to as much revenue as possible, you will you will get a higher valuation. The process will be shorter, um, and frankly, you'll just know a lot more about your business. You have a lot more visibility in your business to, in order to make sure you don't set expectations. I mean, I, I don't know how many investor and in presentations I've seen where it's like we're going to grow 130 percent a year for the next 10 years, and we're going to generate cash flow every year. It doesn't happen. Like I, I've never seen that business, um, one that both generates massive growth and generates massive cash. Uh, and so, when when you uh, generally, the further along you are in understanding the business and revenue, the better off you are. I'll, I'll piggyback on that too, just to play devil's advocate to what I said and what you said, because <laughs> although that is true and you should have traction and revenue, understand that once you cross the the barrier of traction and revenue, now investors actually have something to gauge your business on and it's less about your vision and where you're going. And so, although it is a positive that you have traction and revenue, when you say you're gonna be a $100 million company and you're doing $1,000 a month and you've been in business for two years, it's a lot less believable with that $1,000 versus $0. So that is something to kind of keep in mind. I'm, it, it's a real thing. And once you start putting numbers to, to the table and you plug in that Excel spreadsheet, they can project out. That's what they do is the numbers. As an entrepreneur, you're the visionary. And so just be careful when you start playing the numbers game too early, because that could sock you in the, in the stomach too. Uh, I've done both. I get, I get kicked a lot. John, you mentioned a few uh, that you've done different rounds of funding for your business. What materials did you have to have and for these investors? Did that change over over the rounds? Did you get more? Did they scrutinize more or less? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say <clears throat> the seed round that we did, I think we raised half a million dollars in the seed round. It was uh, a lot less scrutiny uh, and more uh, show me some contracts, show me some revenue, uh, tell me the story, uh, and get them bought in on what you're trying to do. And, and yeah, the numbers are there for the seed round, but it was it was more about like getting them on board with what we're creating along with the revenue coming with it. Um, as we started to do our Series A, it's definitely stepped up quite a bit. Uh, monthly income statement was the final piece, so looking back two to three years uh, on your uh, monthly income statements, and then your forecast going forward. Uh, one thing I noticed is um, when you give all the due diligence items in the, in the fundraising process, uh, the official guys as well, they'll, like, you know, they'll, they'll take it, and obviously the process takes three to six to nine months. Uh, I've actually never seen it done in really less than two or three months, but uh, uh, they'll look at your numbers and, and going through deal, due diligence, they'll, they'll study the next three months and go, all right, he said he was gonna do this next three months, did he actually do it? And try to gauge you know, if what you're saying is actually valid and true. Um, so that, uh, they, they obviously wanna know your growth rate year over year, that's critical, uh, and um, your MRR, uh, from a tech company perspective, which is what we are, uh, monthly recurring revenue is, is critical. And I think uh, our story was we had you know almost 80% growth year over year and really solid growth numbers on monthly recurring revenue. Um, and our, our programs are, are annualized in terms of contracts. That made our story really easy to tell and it made us really appealing to future guys. Um, another metric they want to see that we uh, they looked at a lot was your attrition um, on your customers. They want to see that you're retaining your customers month over month, year over year. If you have high attrition, that's going to be a knock against you. Um, so I definitely want to discuss that. And then uh, you know more stuff about you know your burn rate, uh, how much you're burning every month, how much, um, what's your runway look, how, you know do you have 12 months of cash, six months of cash, all this stuff. Very good. Um, Abe, a lot of the entrepreneurs I talk to, um, you know, they, they're they neck deep in their own company and then they have to go and raise money. They, they liken it to another job, right? It's, it's, it's almost like, well, I've got to pause in the company to go raise money. How long, in your, you know, in your experience, how long do they expect to have to take that time to raise the money? So I'll speak from two perspectives. One of them is my perspective on raising money, and the other one is, uh, my perspective of self money. So from the, I, I equate a lot of this to dating and human relations. I mean, how fast is it gonna be for you to get, find your spouse? I mean, if you don't have your own shit together, like it's gonna be really, really a long time. <laughs> so I think that's, and that's really what's being said here is what is the story, what is your story? What is the story of the person? So it's like, I can see like, hey, you know, it'd be awesome we get together, um, can't pay rent, Still living with my parents, you know, my dog hates me, and it's gonna be really hard to get a date. So I think that's really, it's the truth though, if you really think about it, if you think about it from the perspective of you're having to use the want and the, and the need and the desire for fulfillment from the other side. So in that regard, I think it's really important that the story is communicated consistently and long and for a long time, and really start making sure you know what you're doing before you get into it. For the first time entrepreneurs, I know there's this inherent desire to to approach it from, I can't do this business until I have money, or I have a great idea I can't tell anybody about because I need an NDA from everybody. And once you've done this for a while, you realize that unless you've really cured cancer most likely, you should share your ideas, tell people about it, get advice, get suggestions, and start building the team around you. And that's that story part, right? So if you got if you have yourself together first, then it makes it a lot easier to get a bunch of great friends and get a bunch of great friends together. Somebody may ask you out or accept your date request. So. Now on the self-funding side, I will say it's hypercritical to have a great credit score in my opinion. That's something that we did when we funded Social Smoke. Uh, when I left the helicopter, I had by that time, I was 26 years old and I had saved 70,000 approximately in cash that I invested into the business. And I had 40,000 sitting in my IRA. So I, I made pretty decent money. I, I made, some pretty, made some pretty decent money, saved it, and used that to go into a business so that uh, we could fund inventory. And we could also learn. There's a lot of this process, which is learning. 
uh, as Craig said, once the numbers started hitting, people started evaluating. So in this case, we were able to fund a lot, and by the time we got to the point that we needed, we raised, uh, well, we actually took a loan out for 250000 from Chase, and we, that was a lot of credit to pay back, and there was no equity involvement, and it moved fairly fast, because collectively, we had great credit scores, and we were funding the business ourselves, and our numbers were really high. Uh, by that time, by 2007, we were at, I think, 800,000. Uh, we landed on the 8500 list, and so it was a really incredible opportunity there. So our business was a little bit different. Uh, so I will say you are yourself a potential funding source. Your credit card can be funding sources if you, if you pay attention to that. And if you really are not paying attention to that, that's part of that big story. Like, hey, I'm not really good with money, but will you trust me on my amazing idea? I don't know how hard that, that's pretty hard to sell. I'll piggyback just real quick, just from a traditional venture math perspective, if you're growing at a venture capital rate and you want to raise money from the institutional people, you need 18 to 24 months of runway. So that means at 12 months, you need to start raising for the next round, which gives you three to six months to raise that capital. And to your point about it being a full-time job, unless you're super hot and you're picking and choosing who you're investing from, you better have a really good team sitting in the background to keep the company running because it is a full-time job. And it's not just the time, it's just the mental strain that it takes to raise money and keep your company alive. So you want 18 to 24 months of runway. At the 12-month mark, you're raising because it's gonna take you six months to raise that next round because you think it's valued at this, they think it's valued at that, blah, 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 blah. And occasionally you gotta check in on the company. Uh, and that's kind of the math that investors are looking for. If I give you $6 million, your burn is gonna to equate to 20 months, and we think the growth rate is gonna get you to a point that at 12 months you can raise the next round. That's like the bundle that it has to fit in. Uh, now, that's in a vacuum. It don't always work like that. So you gotta be ready to evolve, but that's the basic math. Now, uh, there's a saying that I've heard that's always, always raise money before you think you need it, and always raise more than you think. Uh, Sounds easy, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce, you just talked about the, the second round that you guys had closed at, at Door. What what percent do you think of those the first investors are in the, the second series, and what what makes a company compelling to go for an investor from one round to the next? So we had uh, this the round we did was our third, and we've, we've actually had quite a high uh, percentage of our of our investors stick in. But you know, really just back to um, kind of back to some points you said earlier, um, they will, it depends on the investor, but some will mark notes when they meet with you, and as far as like, things you've said, things that might not have been in your presentation, things you committed to doing. And when you execute on those, you're more likely to get money. I mean, it's, in many ways, it's as simple as that. It's probably how you would also do the same thing if you were the one you know, investing in somebody else's company. And so, um, you know, I, what I've simply found is it's, it, in many ways, it's, it's the basic things. It's far as be careful what you promise, but obviously you want to promise something that shows your expectations and your enthusiasm for it. But if you don't think there's any way that you can achieve those numbers and you throw them out there, the next time the same investor is not going to find you. Well, don't so. put a uh, sales guy in the position of raising your money. <laughs> <laughs> you sell it <laughs> way more. Uh, Craig, you talked a little bit about you know managing the investor. How, how do you manage an investor once they give you the money? What, what sort of things do they care about? Um, what do you look for in the capital market? I talked about some areas. Some want people to advise them. Some want hands-off capital. Who have you found to be yeah. the best source? You've got to understand your nature as an entrepreneur, right? Some entrepreneurs are looking for operational guidance. Some entrepreneurs are looking for help around growth or. Uh, maybe recruiting. It, it depends on what you really need. You can actually, this is a big thing that I see and I'm very cognizant of is the entrepreneur is in control. Like I, I just want to be really clear about that. People think because the investor has the money and the check that they're in control. That's actually a really bad formula for the relationship. And so you should be very specific about the type of investors you want. If you want to be hands off and you want freedom and autonomy to build your company the way you want to build it, and you want somebody to just be a check, that's who you need to go raise from. And those people look very different than those that say, hey, we want to roll up our sleeves and get in there with you, right? What that means is we're going to get on your goddamn nerves. Uh, I don't know any of those people. Uh, but, 
But you have to, you have, you just have to be very selective about who you want. For me personally, um, you know, this is not my first rodeo. I like people that are. Here's the other thing: investors will tell you that they have some value add beyond their check. Nine times out of ten, it's just a check, right? And then the rest is getting on your nerves and just pinging you because they think they know how to run the business better. And so, understand that the money is the money, and their value add. It's just a sales pitch. They're just trying to get into the best deals they can. But for me, I just understand what I want. And I know with each, each investor, there's definitely a check coming. And then I, I try to identify that one key area where they might be helpful, whether it's today or nine months down the road. Because I don't, if I need 10 things from you, I probably need to go back and revisit some stuff about myself. And so we look for very strategic partners that can help with one key thing. Uh, and then when we're able to call on them, they're there. Uh, but in the meantime, in between time, you keep communication high. Some people are very formal. They do monthly uh, investor updates, which is highly recommended. Myself personally, I like to text and call and just kind of give people the vibe in real time. And if I, you know, if I'm about 45 days late on an update, they still feel like they know what's going on. Uh, I send them, you know, all the updates, what's happening with the business, more like in a, a, a much more organic place. Uh, and so that's just my style, but it's really different for everybody. You've got to be honest and authentic with yourself and your investors because every company is going to have a different story. And so you're going to read something in TechCrunch and it's going to say, do it this way, and that don't work for you, right? And so uh, just be, just understand it's your company, it's your vision, they're your investors, and you should pick and design and architect that in a way that works best for you. Very well said. As, you know, as an investor, as someone that's done venture capital before and in different brands, I will say that something we look for is that communication. And um, a lot of the brands that we've invested in will actually ask us, hey, how do you like to be communicated? How much do you need to be communicated as we're kind of dating and interviewing each other from a capital and, and from a product standpoint? Um, but one of the things that I've noticed that brands or products or companies that don't update me, red flags go way up. So um, even though it takes time, yes, to sit down and write an investor letter, crunch the numbers, et cetera, just speaking from the, the venture capital standpoint, it, it is highly alarming if you don't do that. So call out the time, put it on your calendar, um, just speaking from the agency. It helps to have a template too. If right. you have a template that you can just kind of plug and play or your COO can plug and play or whoever it may be, right? Uh, that way it doesn't take too much time. You know the metrics you're reporting, they get comfortable with it, you find the cadence, or ask your investors if they have a template from one of their portfolio companies that they really like, and maybe you can take that and kind of plug and play with that. But you wanna get those updates out in a, in a natural, you gotta get back to running the business, and like I said, that, it can take time, so find a hack so that, that you can do that, but it doesn't take away from you growing the business. Uh, but you want them on your side when it's time to raise money again. John and, and the others have been through multiple rounds of funding before. When you started raising money, Craig, you kind of hit on it earlier, but did you already kind of forecast out that next round, or did you raise enough money to get you to action and worry about it later? Just one round at a time. Yeah, uh, yeah I think uh, it was, for us, it was uh, hard to determine what the next thing was going to look like, uh, how much money we need, uh, you know, what you're building uh, and your vision, you can kind of see where it's going to go, but it's really hard to see how much money you need. Um, at least, John may have a different perspective, I have that perspective. Uh, pretty much every time I raise money, uh, I would go, man, we're good, like, we're done. We don't need to raise money at all. And our growth rate continues to go up at the same rate, yet all of a sudden, like, there's all these other things. Our business doesn't grow up. It grows out like this, and it's just like next thing you know, you got customer support, you got someone handling your HR, you got you, know, you need people handling uh, managing clients, like salespeople. It just it just grows bigger and bigger and bigger, and uh, that's one thing that we that I, I know from my experience uh, found it hard to see just how much money um, it's going to take uh, going forward beyond that first round. Uh, a John just mentioned kind of building on some key elements of a business. What, from, from what you've experienced and then from what you've seen from other entrepreneurs, what does a business need? I mean, is, do they need a great co-founder? Co do they need a big stack of capital? Do they need customer service? Do they need a patent? What, what are those elements do you think really make the business or at least help get it off the ground? Uh, I'm going to hit 
get back on, on starting with the entrepreneur first. Um, I think it's so important to know what is your core values, what is your mission, what is your purpose, and do those things first. What we don't want, and we have one of our clients, um, they have approximately a $40 million revenue, uh, annual revenue utility company. And I, I'm actually stealing his word directly, miserably rich. And, I, and, and you don't want that position. You don't really want to be in a position where you're building something you don't want. Uh, and I think it's because all of a sudden people have an idea and they start chasing the money part. And then the money will show up. This happens to me. Well, I, I love the day-to-day -day of social smoke. And money is just arriving in the bank account every month. Sounds great. It's just like you have no, I have no idea what I'm going to do next. And, and then I successfully tanked the startup. I'm sure you know that one. And I mean, I didn't even know what I'm doing. And I wasn't communicating all that stuff out to people. And I think that's a, it was a, it's that learning curve that I went through that I think is so important first. It's in the process of knowing what your core values are, what your mission is, that you can communicate that to other people. And then some people say, hey, I believe in the same thing you believe in. Right? And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you start surrounding yourself with a team. Uh, and I felt when I did my, my other startup after Social Smoke that I could basically self-fund the idea up to a point and then take it off and then I get a team. That was the worst possible way to do it. What would be so much better would have been to share the mission and eventually find those people that would be interested in it so they would invest their own uh, heart and soul into it also. Uh, they would bring their own capital, they bring resources, and before you know it, you're sitting with a team of people. It's really impossible to raise money. I, and you know, correct, correct me if I'm wrong from your experience, it's really hard to imagine raising a, seven, a six figure, seven figure, eight figure check if you don't have the experience to know what you're doing and you don't have a team of epic people around you. I think I would be much more willing to invest in Tim Cook's next company with everything I own, uh, the CEO of Apple, than, than some random person who just has a great idea. So I think that's we're going back on your own. And then really I think teams where it starts off because really what they're asking for is what are you going to do and how can I know that you're going to execute it? And when you point back to this amazing team with all this experience, um, it's really solid, really, really, really solid. I think that reduces the risk of the VC firm or the investor. You know, any thoughts on that from the rest of the panel as far as I've got a great team or I've got a great product or I've got great sales? Is from a raising money standpoint, is one of those out there? Depends on the entrepreneur and investor, in my opinion. Some investors like great teams, some investors like, you know, they're product focused. Um, team, I mean, team and product are probably going to come before sales in a, in a significant way. So I'd probably say one of those two things. And if you got a great team, you Probably can get a great product out of a great team. Getting a great product without a great team is hard. I've tried all of this stuff, none of it is hard. <laughs> I've messed up a lot of people. Uh, I'm still messing up. But yeah, I, I think team is super important because the team can power the product. It can enable you as the evangelist of the company to go out and sell and raise money. And, and under, it gives you a confidence. Like when I'm out and about, like I just, I have a phenomenal freaking team. And I just, I know if I'm out on the road for three days and I come back, they're gonna have built this new thing that adds enterprise value that they probably didn't know. They were just like, oh, this is cool, we should be building it. And I'm like, oh my God, investors are gonna love this. You know, and so like having a great team gives you as a leader that, that extra fuel, right? And um, I think, uh, I, I just tweeted about this the other day, like I love that I get to work with capable, smart people. Like I've had, if you've had a bad team, you really start to value a good team. Let me, add, let me add one thing to that. Like, you know, if all of us every day we have to communicate up, like to somebody you report to, could be your investor, could be your boss. Um, you have to report sideways to people that are kind of at your same level, you have to communicate down. And one of the things I've learned the hard way is nobody does all three of those really well. So know which one of those you do really well. Because what I what I've learned is I'm also on the investor side from the angel community side too. If the management team communicates to me really well, my number one concern is they probably don't communicate down in their business really well. So to be honest, I look a lot for management teams. I also look for, if I find somebody who's really slick, kind of a salesperson type of, type of communicator, I really look for who's the person that's actually running the business and that's probably the person who's not going to communicate as well to me. And I want to see both. Like, I don't want a management team that's coming and they're all, you know, rassled asshole and they're all, all great communicators because that probably means that they're probably not doing a good job at that company. Yeah, I'm the rousal dazzle guy at my company. <laughs> I just want to be perfectly clear in case y'all didn't notice that. And my VP of product is phenomenal. She can break down our product forward and backwards and understands 
the trajectory of the operations of our business and how our product drives that. And I can say all of those things in an eloquent way, but she really like understands it, <laughs> right? And so you're absolutely right, it's super important. And as long as I was out there being the sales guy and didn't have that, there was always this, uh, and it's not just her, it's really my whole team, but there was always this lack of substance that some, at some point it would surface, right? And so having that operational side, I'm a solo founder, so I didn't have a technical or operational founder. So when I had a team, I built a, a you know, we over-indexed on operations in, in tech. Uh, and so now there's like this completeness that exists. You gotta have it at some point. But you do what you gotta do until you get to where you get it, right? So if you're the sales person, keep selling. In, in my experience, the, we're gonna rank it, it was sales team and product and uh, when it comes to what was important to the investor, it was surprising to me how little a lot of these investors cared about the product. They they wanted to see the numbers. Yeah, they knew we had a good product, or they knew we had a product, but every time I led an investor presentation with product, like it was kind of like a, you know, print the numbers, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of really what they care about yeah. when it comes to what they want to do. The numbers don't lie. You can, you can sell things, you can get them excited about the product, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna fix this, we're gonna invent that. They don't care. They wanna see the numbers. And that's really the most impactful thing. Uh, team is important too, for sure, at least again from my perspective. But um, numbers was what got them to move. So, so now that this is kind of a, uh, sometimes the, the record scratch in the room, right? Because uh, you can sit there and have a great conversation between VC and the business owner, the entrepreneur, they're on board with the story, they're loving everything, and then the, the topic of valuation comes up, right? What, what, is, what is me and my business work? Well, like Abe said, a lot of entrepreneurs, myself included, we, we are a business, so you're not just valuing your, your business, your product, you're putting a numerical value on you as a person, which is very tough to do. Bruce, lead us off and, and jump in whoever else uh, would like to, but how do you determine the valuation of a company? And maybe speak to it both from the angel side, who's going to want a lower valuation or a fair valuation, and then as the, the door guy. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it is, we all know it's cliche. Valuation is every bit as much of an art as it is science. And, and especially the earlier the stage you are, if you're pre revenue, it's all simply going to be around uh, what's the big market opportunity? Why are you guys going to? Be able to achieve that, and then do you, do you have the team in order to actually think, kind of think them critically that you can do it? It's not just ideas with without any real substance. I mean, valuing that is 100% hard. Um, I'll tell you though, as you as you begin to generate revenue, and you begin begin to to grow, um, where I, where I tend to find the client the evaluation conversations come around really three main metrics. One is revenue growth. The second one is gross margin, and the third one is customer acquisition cost. And so as you begin to grow, I mean, obviously, you know, as you begin to grow, you're, you're going to burn cash, right? Because you're going to be investing in customer acquisition costs. You're going to be investing in sales and marketing in order to grow the business. So they're not expect they're, they're, they know they're going to burn. That's why you're raising money, right? But if you can begin to show a trajectory of revenue and how each dollar of revenue is becoming incrementally more profitable in the business, your gross margin is going up. And your cost to acquire clients, you have visibility in what that is, and you just have the visibility of that going down. Um, there's a lot of magic metrics out there, uh, you know, depending on, on you know, the type of business, oftentimes people look for three to five. They want three to five times return um, on gross profit to customer acquisition costs. Um, and, 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 but that's, those are all metrics that probably matter a lot more when your five, 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollar business is growing to that point. But, you know, as, you know, to, to use the point, I mean, you said a little bit earlier, I mean, when you do have a little bit of revenue, you actually do have something to value. So that is, that is definitely, there's a, a two-edged sword there. Um, but there, there is, I mean, it, it is all art when you're really at the pre-revenue or kind of seven million dollar. I'll, I'll come down the stack just a little bit and just give you guys like some basic math on how to do valuation as an entrepreneur. The way we did it early on is said, okay, Here's our plan and our budget based on the cost to execute this plan. And so then once we knew what our costs were, we were able to say, okay, we're gonna, it's gonna cost us $30,000 a month to do what we think we're gonna do. Once you have that number, 
you can kind of start to look at, okay, it cost me $30,000 a month, I need a year's worth of running room to get to revenue, right, whatever it is. So now that tells you you're raising $360,000. That's the bank. Then you say, what stage is this I'm raising? And there's the pre-seed, seed, and you kind of get the pick, that's the already part of it. And then there's pretty standard percentages that you just give up at these rates, at, at these stages. And so if you're raising a pre-seed $360,000 round, well, and then there's another step of what type of financial vehicle are you using, right? Is it a price round? Is it a safe? Is it a convertible? No, I've done them all. I say just price the sucker right out the gate because it, it, that comes to, that comes back to bite you too in non, if you're not involved in New York or Silicon Valley, the, the notes and stuff will bite you. But you know it's 360, you know you're giving up, let's call it 10% of the company, so now we know the company's valued at 3.6 million, that's the starting point. I need 360,000, I'm giving up 10%, that gives me 12 months of runway. An investor can look at that and say, well, they at least, it is an art, but you've now at least thought about the business. This $30,000 is gonna get spent like this every month, and that is the plan that's gonna get me to my first $500,000 in revenue. Like, that's the math on it. You're not gonna do whatever you put on your Excel spreadsheet, <laughs> but at least you thought through it in a very sophisticated, simple way, and now you can start to find which comes to you. And then the last thing I would say beyond all of that is, uh, one of my investors told me this early on, he's very successful, very, very, very you guys probably have heard of him or his company here locally, but he said, Craig, you know, every time I did an equity deal, I, I felt queasy and I didn't like the deal. And he said, now looking back on every single piece of money I've raised, I'm glad I did. So don't haggle over, if you have a chance to get an investor, especially if you've never raised money, don't haggle over uh, valuation too much, right? <coughs> get the money, go over index, and then you can make up, you can literally make up for investments on the back end. So don't haggle over valuation too much. Uh, get something out there, raise the money, and start building your company. Uh, yeah, I think the, seri uh, the Series A raise is a lot easier to determine valuation than it is in our experience. The seed round, it was tough. Like I, I, I'm still learning about like if we did it right, how do we do it? If I can go back, what I do differently? Um, but it, it's it's tough. It is a bit of an art. Um, from a from a Series A round perspective, um, we did some research. What are some other companies out there that look like look like us in other industries that raise money? What what was their situation? What was their revenue? Uh, what the what the valuation looked like? And that helped us kind of gauge like SaaS based businesses uh, with MRR is going to be around four to six x you know, top line revenue if you got a good growth rate. So that kind of made it easier in the market set that for us a little bit. You know, when the market changes, that may not be true in a year. Um, but when we did our valuation, that was kind of what we, we we came up with what our game plan was. We pitched it to the investor. Uh, they undercut a little bit, and you haggle, and then you, then you close by on it. Um, uh, but that was kind of our technique on the Series A. Um, again, I, I really, I probably should learn from you on the seed round. I, you know, what you think? Because it's, you know, it's hard. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I think we'll, uh, we'll start there, and, and this is another one that it kind of applies to anyone that wants to jump in. Um, but where does an entrepreneur go to look for money? You've got Angel Network, VCs, private equity, national VCs, and office, institutional money. I'm sure most of you have, have been knocked on the door, most, if not all of them. What's your experience with those different types? Sure. So, one of the guys. Um, so, friends and family, you could be your own friends and family. I'll start there. I, I think that's really, again, for the way our particular business was, that made the most sense. Um, but I think there's more experience here on, on the panel for that. We had a lot of success with angel groups in the seed round. Uh, and the moment that changed everything for us was when we found a lead investor at an angel group that, that believed in what we were doing and said, hey, I'm gonna jump in. And then it was like, bam, bam, bam. Like everybody started following because this guy is kind of the, the leader of the pack of that angel group. And when he invests, everybody else wants to invest. And so getting that one guy on board the lead investor that kind of helped the dominoes fall quite a bit. So now working around, finding out who that is, getting those angel groups. Angel group was great. Um, and I think uh, just 
accepting meetings, meeting people. If someone wants to meet you, someone wants to introduce you to somebody uh, that, that maybe might be an investor, take all those meetings. You never know. It has blown my mind how many meetings I was like, this is a waste of time, I'm not gonna go. And then being someone that put in a million bucks in the difference. So like you never know like who you're gonna meet. I would just say, except, you know, if someone can introduce you to somebody, um, don't prejudge, just go meet them and network. Uh, because doors just open up and you find that right fit. I'm going to add just one thing on that too. I think the meet investor is the most important thing. Because you're right. If you, if you find somebody who can uh, kind of vouch for the deal, somebody that people will respect, it does make things money. Because the deal, the, the lead investor, for those that aren't familiar, it's, it's the one who sets the terms. They're going to come in with, so if it's, a, let's say, $400,000 round, they're going to come in with $100,000. They're going to a quarter of the round or something like that. It doesn't always have to be that percentage, but it's definitely somebody who is seen as saying, I'm taking a, a, a significant portion in this round. But they're the ones who are going to work along with you, bring credibility, make your introductions, help set the terms on it. And then you're right, once you have one person who's, who, who's in, other people magically show up. Yeah. And I'll also the uh, Dallas Angel Network, or what you guys call it, on the street. Mm -hmm. um, the Intan North Texas Angel Network is great. I don't know if you guys know all these groups, but I'm happy to just send a list out. Uh, the Baylor Angel Network is great. Uh, the one out in Jack is great as well. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, 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 I'm just saying my whole piece because I just really like tactical like things. And so, you know, everybody said find the first investor and then that'll help kind of open up and, you know, I don't come from a massive network or anything, so I had to hit the streets running and kind of just kind of learn in the streets. So how do you find the first investor? Like that's what that was like my question. I was like, that sounds good, but like how do I get the first investor? And we use a strategy that I, I used to use in my sales background called what what we basically did was we tried to create an atmosphere where people wanted to invest in us and we didn't have to go out and ask them for money. And there's a number of different ways you can do that, but the way you attract that first investor is by building something special, whether that's a special budget or a special PowerPoint or a special company or a special product. And you start doing the work that would attract an investor. And then you tell everybody, and you can't be this kind of, I, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs now that are, yeah, I mean, we raise, and if somebody give me some money, it's cool. I kind of, like you have to be raising money, right? And so if you've created an environment where an investor hears about what you're doing, it's, there, it's better to be inbound than really be out here knocking on doors. Now, if it's an angel group or the networks, which I'll talk to all of those people too, you can apply and you can reach out. But typically your first angel investor is like a, 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 a woman who can write you a $100,000 check, right? And so you need to be building your company and building your plan and building your brand and building your marketing. You need to be out there. People need to know your fundraising and they need to be attracted to it because there's a million places, you know, in Dallas, we're philanthropic, right? And so it's gonna to go to the Dallas Symphony, it's gonna to go to art, it's gonna to go to, the money's going somewhere. Your job is to get them to redirect $50,000 donation to you and see the value and why <laughs> that's gonna help. And, 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 and you're laughing and I, I have literally said that. I'm like, ah, you know, this, this, you know, and I hate to say this for the charities over there, but I was like, hey, Y'all get enough money, why don't you shoot that little check over here, right? So, but, but, but they have, you, you have to create an, an atmosphere where they're willing to sit down with you, meet with you, they're interested in what you're doing, they like your background, the person that referred you spoke really highly of you, and you gotta pique their interest with what you're doing, that's how you're gonna get that first investor. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's not accidentally gonna happen where you get that first investor, you, you, gotta, you gotta attract them. Let me add one thing, actually, I, I feel like this might have been one of the questions you got on there was about the presentation, like what presentation deck do you use? Uh, if you Google like Sequoia deck, it is a great place to start. I think it's on SlideShare, you literally type it up, it's like 11 or 12 slides, and it forces you to synthesize your story. Like I, I had a, a friend of mine raising money recently, he sent me this highly technical deck, and I was like, unless you're, and it was, it was like biotech, unless, unless you're talking to a doctor who knows what you're talking about, you're not gonna raise money. Um, or a fund that knows that. Like, I read the whole thing as I had no idea what they did. And so, um, it's, and, and, and that's not helpful to try to get money from people. So if you, like I said, Google it, I think it's literally called the Sequoia deck or something like that, somebody took it, and, um, and it's, it really just forces you to synthesize your story and simplify it. 
And I would encourage you to have a really, really, really short chat. And you can add, you can have an appendix as long as you want, right? But don't feel like you have to deliver every single bit of information because most of the things that you want to communicate don't matter, you know, if you chip on numbers, they don't matter to the investor. But each investor is going to have their hot button. Some might be highly technical, that might understand what you're doing. Some people might be very highly focused on, you know, the revenue and the growth and things like that. Other people might be focused on uh, margins. I mean, once again, it's, it just depends who you're talking to. And you can have separate slides that you go and you reference. Another thing that we learned more on accidents is uh, the first one I did when I got with Door, when I joined Door, is um, Alex, who had the CEO, and I were at a meeting with an investor. And we had a presentation all ready to go, and they were like, let's sit on these couches. And we were like, well, how are we going to do this? And so we just talked. And it was the best presentation we've ever had. Because sometimes when you have a debt, you kill the flow by trying to steer them towards your story, and they just completely disengage in the process. So what I encourage you to do, as you kind of get further along in it, is create a really short, condensed deck, send the deck in advance, and sit down on the couch and talk. And that's a, a one great way to kind of reconnect. And have the data, you can reference it, they might even have to print it off. Um, but try to stay away from the paper, and try to help them understand you and what you're trying to do and simplify the story. Yeah, I'll, I'll back you up on that. Our deck was one page, one page. And it's because these guys are so busy, they look at all these deals, they don't have time to go through 30, 30 pages. Get all the key points in one page, get them, get, get an appetite built, and go on the competition. One of the things I've seen in Accelerator the last year and a half is that successful entrepreneurs, they will find mentors, advisors, etc. Someone that, that they're not necessarily looking from for money from, but more advice and guidance. Uh, and several of the accelerators seen in the last few months, they'll take me to coffee and, and they'll basically pitch me, knowing that I, I can't invest, we can't have any kind of uh, conflicts obviously within our accelerator group. So I'm off the table, which is great because they can they'll bring a Sharpie and they'll say, here's my deck, here's my pitch, and we'll go through it. And I'll say, this is terrible, this is great, highlight this, stop talking here. And so I encourage you guys to you know, go find that advisor, go find that mentor, someone that's gonna give you the honest feedback. That you have no hidden agenda, you're not looking for money from them. Uh, because when you go in front of an actual VC, an actual angel round, you're gonna be a lot more polished. And that 30 page deck is gonna be 10 pages or, or one page if you're really good. For a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say the micro um, well, Before I, I kind of ask them one more final takeaway question, I wanna open it up to the audience as we uh, wrap up here. Are there any questions that came to mind as we spoke that uh, you guys would like to ask any or all of the panelists? Gas is becoming more and more uh, known as, as a venture capital kind of sense when we're starting to talk about the sales behind us. What's, what's the vibe you guys are doing here? Because right now it's time to be in Dallas to the venture press for your start. The biggest thing I've noticed is the, we have a, a, a massive uh, concentration of family offices. And the second, third, and fourth generation of those offices is starting to kind of get a bit more of the purse, access to the purse, and it's a younger group. Uh, I've noticed that they like tech, they like, they're doing different things versus oil and gas and real estate. Nothing wrong with any of those things, telecom, but I, I have noticed a trend of kind of younger, uh, more enthusiastic, uh, more open uh, family members in these family offices wanting to do other things, thus, spinning up actual funds and investing in a venture way. But I would just say that Dallas, I, I've studied this stuff forward and backwards. You can go back to 1930, the East Texas Boom. We have an appetite for risk. It's an entrepreneurial city. Uh, don't let anybody tell you that Dallas isn't investing. If you can invest in somebody to drill a bunch of holes and hope some oil pop up, <laughs> they can invest in your company. <laughs> You feel me? So Dallas is very entrepreneurial, has, a, has, has an appetite for risk, and, and like you said, the venture capital, especially tech space, is really starting to pick up. The other thing that's happening is they're starting to see tech impact their industries, real estate, oil and gas, and so they're noticing, oh, tech is a thing now, right? And so I, I think it's an exciting time to be in Dallas. It's a lot better than it was, you know, seven years ago when we got started in the uh, but you just got a lot better here in Dallas. And I will say also, um, if you're a company that's growing here in Dallas, it's crazy the attention we're getting from VCs out elsewhere. People are clamoring to get in. They've got people coming in to, to see our, our office every week from a different city, and you don't even want them to come. Uh, they're wanting to get in to Dallas and invest in Dallas. They're trying to get away from Silicon Valley and these other areas. So. Um, I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing. I'd like to see more still. It's still a little tougher than other cities, but uh, it's definitely getting a lot better. 
Other question? I, I, I just completely agree with both of you guys. I, I think the um, I think I've done seven rounds in, in Dallas, and it probably total seventy million dollars. I don't think any of them have been from a local venture capital firm, local family office for sure. sure and sure. exactly as you mentioned, second, third generation. Um, I'm not sure what the local VCs are actually doing, but I don't I don't find it just messy no, in Dallas. Small. But I totally agree, like, that you can get just out of even Austin, you can get into Arkansas. Um, and some of those players are investing, or of course, from outside of this whole region in Dallas. But um, I, I have not had success actually getting um, investments actually from venture capital firms within Dallas, but yes, from family offices. This is a bit anemic. Question for you. Uh, you gentlemen are obviously seasoned presenters, you, you've done serial fundings. Um, the audience is probably really interested in those times when you felt, my goodness, I should have said. What were those should have said that you missed out? We don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God, I literally don't have enough time. Uh, I, I, I try to, I, I'm always pushing the envelope. Like I, I say, I learn something new, read something, come up, I use it that day in an email, in a phone call, in a, a presentation, and so, I, if I'm hoping to say something I probably shouldn't have said every day, and then I just iterate from that. Here's the thing, because they're gonna say no anyway, right? Like, venture capital specifically is, one, it's a small asset class, it's growing quickly, but it's a small asset class, and the capital goes to a very small group of entrepreneurs, and the numbers are, you know, dauntingly, dauntingly devastating when you think about, like, the chances of you actually getting venture capital. So I'm less concerned about like what I said wrong and just figuring out like how I can say the thing better next time. So I'm really not looking back like, oh, I should have said this. I'm like, oh, I, okay, I'm gonna say it like this next time. You know what I mean? Another question. Another question. Um, in terms of capital raise, have you, someone mentioned California and Sand Hill Road. Uh, has most of the capital raises you gentlemen have been doing here in the city or elsewhere, other cities or across the board? The institution has been out of here. Out of here? Yeah, we, um, our primary venture partner is in New York, mm -hmm. uh, but we actually took money from Wall Street um, in our last round, so I think it's important to like involve in that local VCs as well, but um, predominantly for us it's been, well, Angel is all local as well. Local. So, and I'll say my, to answer your first question, my, my should have, yeah. um, I should have valued the company more mm -hmm. uh, in my seed round, that's my biggest regret. Um, you know, it was, it's nerve wracking when you're starting a business. You're like, is this fair? You know, I don't want to seem greedy. And after going through it all, like, I would have doubled the valuation that I put, and I wish I could have that back. <laughs> I mean, I think that there's a, there's a, there's a as entrepreneurs, it's really hard to do what we do. And there's always this question of, can we pull this off? You know, and I think they got in my head a little bit, and I wish I would have, I wish I would have believed in my, myself, my team more, and said, no, we, we are worth this, because I think they would have taken it. Assuming the person is legally able to help you, um, I mean, I guess the, the only examples that I generally find with that are either people who really legally can't help you or investment banks or some version of that. And I, I, I think, you know, the time you really bring in somebody to help you on that is when you're really running a dual process. We basically say, I want to raise money and or sell my business. Uh, I think that's a good use of time if that's where you're at in the business, uh, but that's obviously a much later stage and probably what we're talking about here. Another question? Let me, let me add to the first one there. Um, I, 
a corporate tax attorney, it's one of my best friends, and so important to actually get the documents and everything set up properly. Um, so always involving an attorney like that would be my advice because those small little things can become illegal, uh, can create contractual problems, and then I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the future, a VC firm will want to really touch you because your cap table is messed up, everything is not right about the organization. So downloading, you know, raising $400,000 and downloading something off Google because you're trying to save a few thousand dollars in attorney fees is probably not a smart thing. Well, Accelerators are good if you find the good one, right? And so there's a lot of accelerators. There was like this explosion of accelerators from like 2012 to like 2016. Like this just went bananas, like nationally, but especially even here in Dallas. And so again, I think it goes back to you as the entrepreneur. What are you looking to get? What is the accelerator offering? What are they asking for in return? So at our previous company, Kairos, we went through New Me Accelerator, which was an accelerator for African-American owned technology companies. They didn't give us any cash but it was backed by Google for Entrepreneurs, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, you know, the Ford Capital. And so we got to learn a lot of stuff that we were able to use in our fundraise, uh, even though we didn't get capital and we had access to investors through that network. So for us, that was great. You just gotta find ones that, that work for you. Um, and, and you know, if it's your first time, you know, maybe it's a thing. On the, on the somebody asking you to pay them to help you raise money, and it's, I feel like you were asking about like early stage companies probably, more so than later stage companies, which is, a, is different. No, uh, if you find an advisor that can help your business, there's nothing wrong with offering advisory shares for them to come in and you know help with a number of things, not necessarily raising money. Um, and and those are, that's a really small number. I mean, typically you're talking about like 0.25% up to like 1% for advisory shares, and it's gonna best over three to four years just like the team. Um, and so if somebody's willing to do that and they've got something, yeah, sure, we can look at equity, but cash is super important at an early stage. I, I can't pay you some consultant fee to help me maybe raise money, like, he promise. So let me, let me add one thing on that too, um, is, <laughs> I recognize some of you guys might be starting something as a side hustle while you're doing something, that might be a little bit scenario, but if you're really going all in for something, I would encourage you to work in a co-work environment. I'm not saying that because we're in a co-work environment right now. But it's important to be around people. Um, you, you learn things, you get the people, let people challenge what you're saying, you meet people, you might need money inadvertently. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, if I were starting a business and I was just myself and I was going full time on it, I would probably work in a place like this. We were, we were uh, door initially. Um, it's really, really critical to be around people. Personally, that's one of the reasons I, I joined EO. I noticed I'd go to dinner with my friends that had corporate jobs, you know, and I, I'd talk about, man, how are you guys work, you know, how are you creating company culture? Or what's the best way to compensate people? And they just shrug their shoulders and say, I, I don't care about that. I'm a, you know, in-house counsel for an oil and gas company or something like that. So EO for me was, was putting me around like-minded entrepreneurs, people I could ask those questions and say, I can't motivate my people. What are you guys doing? And the same thing with Accelerator. These are all companies in roughly the same stage of their business, right? Between that $250 million mark, they're facing the same challenges, the same opportunities, the same capital raising constraints, et cetera. So if nothing else, just like being in a co-working space, it puts you in direct contact with people who are going through what you're going through and can either give you advice or give experience years, et cetera. So personally, that's what EO has been like for me as far as an accelerator goes. And Craig said, like Craig said, there's different types of accelerators, there's incubators, there's ones that take positions in your company, there's ones that don't, et cetera. So explore the different types out there, but above all else, I think what it does is put you around like-minded people, which most people out there aren't. <laughs>